Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. We sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of this great country called Canada. Now, over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone. Today, we are honored to be sitting down with the town of Picto, Nova Scotia, Deputy Mayor Melinda McKenzie. But before we get into today's episode, I just want to take a moment and say thank you. Thank you to our numerous backers who have subscribed over the month of October. Your support means the world to us. Now, if you want to join that growing list of subscribers, please head over to the Cross Border Interviews website and hit the Support the Show page. For as little as $3 a month, you can make municipal issues matter again. Now, on to our interview. Melinda, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I sort of want to start with a generic question, but it's a question that I ask every single person who's ever come on this show. So you're no exception. And that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? Well, I think I'll probably give a more unique answer than other people. So even though I was student council president in junior high and high school, never really saw myself in the political game whatsoever. But I lived overseas for 14 years and I taught internationally. So moving home, I, like first of all, I had a feeling like I needed to be home. Um, I was a, basically an unofficial ambassador for my country. And the last place I had lived was Cambodia. And there weren't a whole lot of Canadians there but there were definitely some and even in Nova Scotian and I had my the director of the school he had moved to well he had always lived in Ontario I guess and still he started to do this international circuit thing and he has roots in Poplar Hill which is close to here so that was kind of cool but anyways we have a United Nations Day or an international day within the school where we celebrate different cultures and there wasn't a lot of people to do the Canadian side of things Long story short, like I did the Canada side of things, but then I thought, oh, this is a really whitewashed version of Canada, and I don't have any Indigenous perspective, when really I think that's pretty important for our country. And so I struck up a conversation with Chief Andrea Paul, who is over at Pictolanian First Nation, and asked her if these activities seemed appropriate for her. Like, she's probably thinking, who is this person? This is so random, but I just didn't want to like, I also didn't, I wanted to do service, but also not disrespect any cultures by like drawing attention to them sort of thing. So I, from that, I decided like, I need to come home and I needed to learn more about uh, the Mi'kmaq culture I grew up across the Harbor from and literally knew nothing about. And that's what I did. But in the meantime, in all of my time overseas, I've always been on like social committees where I'm organizing events to help people feel at home. Like I just always have like a feeling or urge to do that. And when I did move home, I felt like that sort of community feeling that I had grown up around was lacking somewhat. And I had lots of people plant seeds um, around me saying there's an election coming up, you should run because I think you'd be really good for our community. And bringing that sense of community back. So I put my name in the ring and I won. So yeah, it was all like about community. Like I didn't know much or anything about municipal politics really. And I've learned so much in the time that I've been on council, but like it was more so for like the community. I felt like I could play a role in a decision-making table that could, you know, give back to the community. I wanted to be a resource, I guess. Growing up, did your family talk about politics? Really? So you're really a green candidate when it comes to poli at, at the at your entrance into politics then? Yeah, they might talk about it like when when elections were coming around, but yeah, that's it. <laughs> so what was the desire to get involved community-wise at an elected level, because you could have chosen many different routes when you came back to Canada and you re you moved back to your community. You could have chosen nonprofits. You could have chosen just volunteerism. But you chose a unique path in in any aspect of the game of saying, okay, I I, I want to give back. I want to grow my community. People are sort of poking me in this direction, but mm -hmm. ultimately you have to make that decision. So, what was the final decision that that for you that said, okay? Well, if people are asking, Melinda's voice should be on council. 
Yeah, and well, just having looked at council and its makeup and stuff, I thought the representation for my like age group and like I felt like I could be a voice for those that aren't normally heard, and I'm usually pretty good at doing that outside of pol political sphere of things. So, yeah, I just thought I'm gonna I'm gonna try it out and like I. Yep. It, I can't really tell you exactly why I could have dropped out of the running. My dad was really sick at the time and ended up literally passing away a week before the uh, election day. But I was just, I just, I felt like my town needed me in some weird way. I thought I was, it, it's strange. I can't. So what year did you first put your name on the ballot? Uh, 2020. So 2020. So you're this is you're you're coming up to the third year because it usually uh, you're going to be going up for re-election next year in 2024 if you decide to stand. Um, 2020 is kind of a, a unique entity in itself because you're at the tail end of COVID-19. A lot of things have changed. Mm -hmm. But I want to talk about the campaign period for yourself because campaigning is a unique beast in itself. It's something that you 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 think you have a pulse on the community. You think you understand the community, but when you door knock and talk to your neighbors and talk to your fellow community members and try to learn about what their issues are, sometimes your eyes are blown open to the, to the issues that people are uh, dealing with. For you, what was that experience like to talk to them about their issues, about what they're going through in their community? Set aside the COVID nineteen because I think that sort of changes the whole aspect. But what did you hear at the doorsteps? Yeah, so my doorstep visiting was limited because of the COVID thing. Like, and it's, I had like a mask on and I knocked, I literally <laughs> had like a, a ruler with a hand on the end of it. And I used it to like knock on people's doors. Like I was trying to be as like, I show up and I have no impact on you other than the fact that you might have someone that you want to vote for to represent you in your community. Um, yeah, I learned a lot. And basically, I, I also, I feel like I'm just a problem solver by nature. So it was a lot. I because I'm learning all this new information. I'm like, Oh, my goodness, like, it's like, I see what I think needs help. And these things are completely unrelated. And just like all this new stuff. So I had my phone out the whole time. And and this is another thing I feel like with COVID, I my communication skills are are pretty great and I have a really I'm really savvy online and don't like I I knew that's something that a lot of other counselors that were running in this election were bringing to the table or like I just felt I could be a voice online and a presence online for to be more accessible to people really um but when I so I had a, a lot of my campaigning was online and I had a google form that people could fill out with questions and whatever for me and I just different ways to gather information for people that wasn't just knocking on the door and yeah I had lots of questions to follow up on once I was elected that's for sure because yeah a lot of things I couldn't I was like wow I never really thought about that so then I'd have to go home and google it and figure out what that's like and but wasn't really empowered to ask questions at the town office yet you know so yeah was there an apathy did you find in your community when it comes to comes to municipal politics even during that election because traditionally and i say i paint a broad stroke here when i ask when i say this statement but traditionally provincial and federal politics takes up all the air when it talk, when we talk about politics and government but municipalities you don't hear that often did you did you did you see an apathy where people wanting to engage with someone who was knocking on their door or engaging with people online like you were during that election? Um, I'm not, I I I don't have anything to compare it to, right? So like I don't. No, but for even for yourself, right? Because you you seem like someone who didn't really I don't want to say didn't get involved, but didn't really take an interest in the, the political arena until you got back in the community event did you sort of get that feeling when you're out door knocking in that campaign that people uh, were similar like you like they they were okay with the government or they were understanding where the government was coming from oh no i think that there was more frustration than any for sure it was more frustration with the okay. government and and some of the things are things like that were beyond 
the capacity of a municipal councilor, which I later found out when I would Google it or whatever. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's the, uh, the, the worst thing about municipal government is the fact that people don't understand the jurisdictional roles that people have with municipal governments. So <laughs> I understand where you're coming from on that one. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. So, yeah, I think that it's, yeah, definitely more frustration than apathy, but, and I really had, like, I wasn't around at all. Like, I wasn't voting from, I think I did one ballot whilst I live overseas, and then the next time it was election time for the federal election, I was ineligible to vote. Um, I don't know why. Because there was some sort of rule change, but anyways, <laughs> municipal wise, I didn't, I didn't even think about it. But now I know that it's important, and <laughs> it, it certainly is. So you you get elected, and it sort of changes people, and sometimes it changes people, sometimes it keeps people humble, as always. But you you walk into that council chambers for the very first time as an elected official. What is that experience like? Because now you have the weight and responsibility of your community on your shoulders. The decisions you make, the challenges of your community rest on your shoulders and how you vote impacts people the next day. How much responsibility and weight do you put on yourself to be prepared when you walk into that council chamber is to understand what's going on in the community, but also understand that you're not going to please a hundred percent of the people a hundred percent of the time. <laughs> yeah. So that sentiment, I think that I struggle with that a little bit still, because I do want to, I am, I say that I am a people pleaser. Like I want people to be happy that they voted for me and happy that I'm representing their points of view or whatever. But like the first time I walked in, I felt incredibly proud. I was just like, Oh my gosh, like my my town wants clearly wants me in this role. So I'm going to, I'm going to do my best at it. Um, that I feel like, I feel like I could go on a sidebar conversation on that piece right now. Um, go for it. Go for it. Wherever you want to take this conversation. This is the great thing about a conversation between two new old friends. It goes anywhere and I love it. Okay. So no, I'm, I'm also a full-time teacher, as you know, but I, I went in really optimistic and positive and thinking that I could make, you know, more change than I probably have. But I know that other people would say that I'm discrediting myself for what I've done and whatnot. But because I do work full time, I'm so limited in the like professional development that I could access as a counselor. And you know what? That's been the most frustrating part about this whole thing for me. I've written to the FCM. I've written to NSFM and other groups and I'm just like can we do things that aren't like between nine to five Monday to Friday because that's literally just not how the world works anymore like it's and yeah that's that's frustrating I was talking to the CAO down at my town office today and he was saying that there was another community in Nova Scotia and they have their meetings once a month from eight to twelve every in the morning on a Monday and I'm just like that's crazy like it's it shouldn't be that you you can only be a counselor and be the best that you can be as a counselor if you're retired or like, cause our town doesn't pay enough. I, and it's just. Well, I, that, I, that brings up a good question and I'm glad you brought it up because it's a question I always ask people. This is not a full-time job, but it's a full-time hour job. You are counselor 24 seven. You are deputy mayor 24 seven. Even when you're teaching, you are deputy mayor of your community. And mm -hmm. when you go to the grocery store, when you go attend events, you are the you are a community representative. And the pay is not there. So I, I don't care who you are, even if you're a, a large city, you might get better pay. But for small towns like the town of Picto, it's not full-time pay for a full-time job. It's part-time pay, even that, for a full-time job. How do you balance that? Because that is probably the biggest challenge that a lot of people who sort of get into the office don't realize until they're already elected. Yeah, it's it's a big balancing thing. And another thing you don't realize is that there's all these committees that you're automatically on too that are just like more things. And you hope that you're passionate about the committees that you're on so you can invest that time. But yeah, 
finding the time is really, really tough. And I'm, I'm the type of person that feels like anything worth doing is worth doing well. And I feel that I've definitely sacrificed on that in different areas because it's impossible because there's just too much. And where I could have like a one track mind to, to focus on this particular project. So national day of truth and reconciliation, that was a big project of mine for my town. And like, we did an awesome job of it, but I wanted to just focus solely on that, but you can't because like I have my school life that will play into it. And then I have my, you know, my personal life that plays into it with family and whatnot. And then just anything that might come up from a resident that I want to help out with. And often their concerns are more immediate or need immediate attention. So yeah, so now my project is <laughs> getting pictures for the grand opening of the 50th year at our at our hockey rink on Saturday because I want to have at least 50 photos of the rink over the years. And I'm just like, oh, I could have done a better job of this if I did it sooner. But like, yeah, it's hard. <laughs> so you, you've you said, and I'm not taking you out of context here, but you, you've you openly said that you contacted FCM, you've contacted the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities as well to try and figure out how to do this better. Now, you've been in the position for three years and I've got to ask the sort of million dollar follow-up question to anything where it says, I have a issue. What's the solution? How can municipal politics and municipal governance, government, be more adaptive to the realities that we live in today to make more people like yourself who want to be engaged, who want to be involved in their community, actually step up and be part of their community at the elected level? Yeah, I don't know. I feel like the whole nine to five thing, that's like, really big and people can't get out of it and if we just broke that mold a little bit and had more flexible hours maybe one of the days you don't open the town office till 12 but it's open until 8 p.m like what's the like why not i don't know like i and i think, i'm not think outside the box in some sense yeah because we've had to adapt and think outside the box, like the fact that we have so many people that are able to work from home or continue working from home because of COVID, like clearly we can adapt. We're pretty adaptable. <laughs> but it certainly is. One of the big things that I've seen with you, and I've been following you for some time, but I started following you on social media probably in the summer of this year, 2023. And it seems like you're very active on social media. And I say that because I, I follow a lot of municipal leaders, but you seem very active. Now, you talk about engagement and you talk about sort of the uh, engaging with people on the social media platform. How, why is communication so big for you? Why do you believe that communication is so big for a municipal councillor like yourself to engage with its residents? Because it's literally my job. I feel like... <laughs> It's like, can, can I introduce you to a few counselors from across Canada who would disagree with that statement? Oh my gosh. Sure. Cause on it, like if we don't have communication nailed down, I just feel like there's so many room there's, there's, it opens up so many holes to just fall through, like for messages to miss being relayed for them to be miscommunicated. Like communication is like my end all be all. And I, yeah, I just if if you don't have that, if you're not doing it well, then I don't I don't think that people are doing their jobs. So when when you talk about communications, it, it's a double edged sword because communication comes with good and bad. And I'm mm -hmm. assuming you've seen the good and bad, right? Mm -hmm. As an elected official, you have to listen to both sides of any issue. Is it hard to listen to some sides of issues where you you're sort you're sort of understanding of where they're coming from but you know at the end of the day you're going to vote a certain way yeah absolutely so on that point like I feel as long as I can communicate like <laughs> if it's negative or whatever as long as I'm able to communicate then I'm I'm happy with that like it could be super frustrating and as but I I feel like I need to try but that being said like people around here we have very famous Facebook group. It's called the Picto County and Area Rant and Rave. I'm not sure if anybody else from around the area talked about it, but it's just an airing place for residents from like it's got a huge following, like huge following. And I 
don't get notifications from it because it could just like ruin your day. And when people get on there and they're airing like their issues with with counsel or situations on there and I can't communicate because that's not the platform to do it, that's when it gets frustrating, most frustrating for me. So how do you do it respectfully? Because that's the key word when I think about communications is respectfully, respectful communication. And you have to listen to people. And those Facebook groups, every community has them. Picto is not any, not unique in the situation where they have them. But yeah. there are there are actual concerns on there where you have to sort of, well, you don't get notifications. You have to go, oh, but why aren't they bringing it to me? Why aren't they actually bringing it towards town council? So how do you respectfully communicate with people in a way that people understand that you're listening to them and you're hopefully going to be able to address some issues with them? Well, luckily I think that I'm very transparent and I'm, because you've seen, I'm very active online. I'm sure that most people can see that I, anything I do is with like positive intent of like sharing information or just like trying to make situations better even. So because I have the reputation of doing that, I think in town that I want to help and I am a respectful person, I think that that helps. And ha like when I do see things that I feel need to be addressed, I can message, like I'll private message someone or ask them if they want to have a conversation um, or talk to any, like if I know someone that was involved in the conversation, just reach out to them to make sure that they just like understand why something is that way or and I've also written before and on posts saying, instead of maybe commenting here, please do reach out to council so that they can try. Cause I know it can be frustrating and maybe people have failed before, but like, yeah, like try people. I, I want people to come at me and I want people to, to trust me with their problems because I legitimately do have the best intention of helping people. And Luckily, I think that my town sees that. So, I'm um, yeah. So I wanted to ask one last question before we turn on turn to the community as a whole. Uh, but I want to sort of ask three years as a counselor. Um, the, sorry, as deputy mayor. I apologize. I should well, be correct. No, it's I, so we take turns with our deputy mayor. Oh, okay, it, okay. This so, is my so council deputy mayor, and then counselor I'll be soon. Okay. Yeah. So. Two years as counselor, one year as deputy mayor. <laughs> I could say that correctly. Yeah. Um, there are people who are looking because elections are a year from now. You've been in it for three years. What advice would you give a prospective person who's looking at potentially running for municipal office in Nova Scotia or even across Canada that you wish you knew before you put your name on that ballot in 2020? I, I just would encourage people to do it. Like, just try it, throw your, throw your hat in the ring and see what happens. I like, honestly, if someone's thinking about it, what do they have to lose? And they're probably going to keep the, what if in the back of their minds, just, just like try it. Um, what's been frustrating for me really honestly is like I mentioned before the whole nine to five thing. Like, I don't feel like I have learned a lot, but at the same time, I so wish that I could have learned more, but it it would involve me taking time away from my school and my students. And I, I'm also pretty principled, so I don't like doing that. And I like, I don't want to play that conflict of interest card sort of thing, but I don't know, it's tough. So if you're, and then I also want people who are my age, I'm going to sneeze, <laughs> maybe not. I want people I will cut the sneeze out. Yeah, no, went away. Um, I I want people like within my age group, like the 40 and under group, like we need representation on council, but like at the same time, it's hard. You're unless you're retired, unless you have the sweet savings account, like other but, like so you you say you like to be challenged. So I'm gonna challenge you a little bit on that statement. 
you you wanted the job so why should people care that you you are struggling going back and forth between being a teacher and being a counselor and i'm not saying this i'm just trying to trying to sort of play devil's advocate with you for a second because i can imagine there's probably people out there saying well if you didn't want the job if you didn't know what the job entitled if you didn't know that uh you're going to be doing two jobs and sort of being torn between two places why do it so what do you say to people who sort of fight back on that issue of, okay, you wanted the job, so you have to deal with the ramifications of what comes with it. Well, I think that I just, yeah, I, I did want the job and I, and it's, and it's been great. And it's not so much that I would, you know, want people to, it's just that I feel for me giving myself to my community, I could have gave a better version of myself had I, known that so much of this yeah. learning happens outside like I, I didn't know that so much the the growth and the learning would be outside of like or wouldn't be outside of my school hours you know like I didn't think it would be so inaccessible to me and that's that's the biggest thing and I've asked as well with certain conferences like is there a recording of this available and and, and I have gotten recordings of some sessions to watch but there's a lot that isn't um yeah, I took time off to go to the Sustainable Communities Conference in Ottawa this past February because that's something that I'm pretty passionate about. Like I ran my whole campaign with like recycled signs and painted boards and never printed any new material. I used the advocate, like the local paper with the article in it that said everything about me that I would want people to know. But just that, like it just, I don't, I feel like I'm ripping off the towns, the residents really by not. Like it sucks it for them more than me. Yeah, it sucks for them more than me that I didn't get the, I didn't get the opportunity to grow and learn as much as I, I thought I could. Yeah. Hey, there's always next term, but I want to turn to the next segment here, if you don't mind, because I think yeah. this is the, this is an important segment as well, and it's about the town as a whole. Now, before I ask this question, I'm going to preface this first statement by saying. This is a conversation between the deputy mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not a policy of council. This is the deputy mayor's opinion. I don't know why, but we get emails about this. So okay. with that being said, what do you believe as of recording this episode, this interview is the biggest issue facing your town today or issues so obviously you sent these questions to me in advance and I had looked at them and this is one that I was like, oh, it's this. No, it's this. No, it's this. And I'm like the biggest. And ultimately, I'd have to say healthcare shortage because everything is a ricochet from that. I mean, we have more drugs in our community than I feel like I've ever seen before um and that boils down to not having the right addiction and mental health pieces in play because we just don't have the robust health care system that we really should or need right now um we people are suffering with the fallout from covid we had like hurricane fiona like kicked our butts here and like i know for the even still, like I'll go somewhere new on a trail and I'll be like, oh my God, like, it's just like, it's heartbreaking. And it's, and then every time that we get wind warnings, you're just like, like I had a piece of my tree that was literally smaller than my water bottle, stab my roof above my kitchen sink. So it was like raining a little bit into my kitchen sink. And I was, and so every time there's like a wind warning, you're like, what's, what's going to happen? So there's definitely some PTSD from that. And just, we don't, we didn't address that like at, at a healthcare level because people probably think, why would you address that? But it's, 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 it's affecting people. It's like people are stressed about money because they're like, our insurance costs have gone up a little bit and people are thinking, oh, they're going to keep going up. Things are becoming less affordable and we have to plan for more emer emergencies that are resulting from climate change, which is another thing that I could have mentioned, but 
Yeah. At the end of like, I think healthcare is the biggest thing. Like people, we want to bring in more populations. We want to like population decline would have been an issue for like previous councils in, in town. But I think that we've done pretty well to bring that up. But like, I, I don't know, like why are we building all this new housing when we don't have the doctors for the people to, to be healthy and live here, you know? And, and I lived in a third world country where I had amazing healthcare. So it's just really odd for me to, to, to see Canada like this, you know, we're, we're a rich country and yeah. So healthcare. <laughs> so you just mentioned four things, mm -hmm. healthcare, affordability, climate change, population. I want to talk about a few of them. If you don't mind, I want to start with healthcare because it seems to be the most uh, pressing issue for yourself that you believe is the most pressing issue for your town. Now, you and I both know, and I think the majority of people listening, healthcare is not a municipal oh, responsibility. Yeah. <laughs> say that. But, but here's the thing. We're seeing that more municipalities like your town, like their communities across Nova Scotia or even across Canada, are needing to deal with the healthcare crisis because you are the government that people rely on the most, even though they may not think that. So what is your community, what is your council doing to sort of address these healthcare issues in a timely fashion while you wait for the provincial government, Tim Houston of the Progressive Conservatives, to come to the table and hopefully address these issues municipally and even locally or even regionally? Yeah, so I, yeah, I'm just... I'm just thinking again, because I'm adding to my thoughts. Sorry. Um, no worries. No worries. Yeah. I, I, I just, I, I find it fascinating because I've done probably 150 to 200 of these episodes with municipal leaders from across Canada. And I would say a handful and less than a handful, probably two or three have said healthcare. And I find it fascinating. So I want to know, because most people will say infrastructure, affordability, which you did as well, uh, housing, but you said healthcare. And I find that fascinating because you, you're right. You just went through the Hurricane Fiona. You got pummeled by wildfire smoke during the summer as well in 2023. Nova Scotia and the Maritime Provinces have kind of been on a sort of uh, path of like every natural disaster you can think of. Um, and yes, healthcare comes with that because smoke causes uh, respiratory issues, which means healthcare. Uh, Fiona causes PTSD, healthcare, mental health and addiction. So what what do you see the town, what, what can the town do in the short term until the province comes for the long term? So we have a group called Healthy Picto County. And actually one of the other counselors from the town of Trenton is on that and she does an amazing job at their, her role her name is Nicole LeBlanc and it's doctor recruitment straight up for Picto County they have an awesome book that they came out with that I used for welcome packages when I first started I was like we're not welcoming people to our community so I wanted to put welcome packages together so they do a great job and we fund them one dollar per resident so that's like thirty three hundred dollars that we give to them to do this recruitment work but um at the same time it's it takes it's a lot of volunteers so i know that they get a group of doctors that like must be at dal i'm assuming but they could be other places and they might be you're interested in rural medicine so that's another challenge like nova scotia as a whole we have like the healthcare problem but rural Nova Scotia is just next level because who wants to commit to rural Nova Scotia if they've never really been here? So Nicole sets up like uh, a day. I know they go on a boat and just like a day in the life of Pinto County sort of thing. And if she ever has any hiker doctors or healthcare workers on the docket, she'll shoot me a message. She'll be like, Hey, can you take this person for a hike? So I've taken a couple of prospective doctors for hikes um, on some of our trails. So anything I can do to like appease people to hear. And I have the whole experience of living overseas. Like I have a very different perspective on life in my town after having lived in other countries. So yeah, it's, it's not, I like that I can give that. And I think that more programs like Healthy Picto County are more fuel for Picto, like Healthy Picto County to do more recruitment would be great, but yeah, it's tough. Yeah. 
don't know. You talk about affordability as well. And I can imagine you're probably, as I say, you as in the town is about to head into their budget cycle to prepare the 2024 budget. And there's a lot of people struggling right now. And I am I'm not trying to say that is a bad thing. And it is a bad thing that people are struggling. Mm. But you play an in- impact onto that as well, because the decisions you make in this budget are going to impact your residents. And over the last three years, we have seen a lot of municipalities try to trim fat from their municipal budgets to make sure people don't uh, suffer at the consequences of the municipal budget. So when you go into this new budget cycle, is there an added pressure knowing that the decision you're about to make is going to impact your residents who are already struggling, who might be living paycheck to paycheck, and who might say, if there's a 5% increase or a 3% increase, that might mean someone having to go without food for a week, if it means going uh, towards taxes for their municipality. Yeah, interesting you say that. We just had a public hearing and about a marketing levy for our accommodation providers. That's just about that. And my issue is, like, I know things are expensive. I don't want to be responsible for making people pay more money. And I think like what you said, the fat trimming has to happen. We set our budget for this year for paving and the paving tenders came back like double or more than double what we had put out. So, cause the price of concrete went up 200% and the price of plastic piping went up 200%. So like one of our paving projects became a million dollar paving project. So that got That's- cut. Yes. Cause we had to do sewer sidewalk and and the street itself it's on a it's a it's the steepest street in town it's in desperate need of being repaired because it's not been repaired in a really long time not a lot of people drive on it but it still needs to be repaired and the infrastructure needs to be repaired but like that's a lot of money so it do people understand that though do people understand that thing costs are going up I'm not sure. I like to hope that they are, but that's (laughs) frustrating because they'll be like, why isn't this being fixed? Or why isn't, why don't we have a sidewalk here? And I'm just like, like, things are very expensive. So like putting new things, like, yeah. And doing things right. That's another thing because before like there'd be paving projects that were done that were where like it was just paved. Whereas we know we need to replace the pipes underneath. So why would we just do the paving when the other things need to be done. So that that does get very, very expensive. So yeah, I I take a lot. That's probably one of the things I stress more about the idea of putting the tax rate up, which we've only done once in three years. And I hope that's it. <laughs> so how do you balance the individual needs with the community needs? Because if I go ask a hundred people in your community today, what their biggest issue is, they might talk about uh, mental health, they, uh, the health issue. They might talk about affordability, climate change, pop, uh, d- depopulation, but they're going to have individual needs as well. They're going to talk about that pothole, that that massive pothole, even though it might be two inches deep, that's in front of their house that needs to be fixed. Or like you said, that sidewalk that needs to be put in front of their house because they want to feel safe walking downtown. Um, and you, at the end of the day, know that you only have a certain amount of money and you can't please every single person with every single issue that they have. But you have to look at the individual issues as well as the community issues. So how do you balance the individual against the community to make sure people's issues are being addressed when it comes to these budget times as well? And sort of side note, is it hard to say no to people when their asks are too unrealistic? Yeah. So yeah, when their asks are too unrealistic, um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, if it's, I do always try to help for sure. And I'll take like all the personal complaints on board. If I'm unable to offer some sort of solution or like, it's all about communication. First of all, I should have started with that. So communication, like if I get a message from someone about some a personal grievance, I'm not going to leave it for 48 hours or a week or however long I'm going to get back to the person right away. So straight out of the gate, they trust that I'm, they appreciate that I'm communicative. <laughs> and then from there, like, I'm, I'm going to hear you out. Uh, I, I'm pretty straightforward and honest. If I, if it's like the sidewalk thing, I'm like, 
the cost of concrete is really expensive. I, I, I put a word in like, I, like we have a lot of bad streets in town. So there's lots of complaints about that and plowing. So with the plowing, for instance, if people are annoyed that their streets well, not are, plowed. Are, are you telling me that people complain about snow plow removal? I would never have imagined that. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So with that, but I'm, I'm like, I, I, I have the plowing route saved the priority pr plowing and salting and, and the sidewalk route saved. And I do a post about that at the beginning of the season every year. Like it's just giving that information and access to the information. Cause some, sometimes things are just the way that they are. And I will always question them when they, when they are that case, cause I'm genuinely like to know why things are the way that they are sometimes. But yeah, and then like with the community, I, you just have to look at the best interest for the community. So it means like engaging with more people um, and then also just engaging with my with fellow council and things and asking for their advice. Like I'll reach out to the mayor quite a bit and I'm pretty, I'm in communication with the CAO a lot and I appreciate his thorough knowledge of the MGA and trust that he's always doing things by the MGA. So that's, and and yeah. Like it's, it's as annoying as sometimes you got to use the MGA as your, your correspondence the, the, the residents. Yeah. Cause you're just like, well, that's what the MGA says. So. Um, I just realized we're at 40 minutes into this interview and I think we even started a little bit early and I have, I want to get to my last subject because it's my favorite yeah. subject and it's a subject that's important to me because I believe that tourism is a big factor that municipalities need to promote more. Mm -hmm. And I say that because I like touring Canada. I like spending my economic dollars in Canada. I like visiting communities and I've made this promise. And I'm going to keep this promise. If you come on my show, I come to your community. So I will That's be in cool. Pic the town of Picto later in spring of 2024 to visit all these other great communities in Nova Scotia that I've been to, I've chatted with. So as a tourist, besides visiting you and grabbing a cup of coffee, what should people do in the town that sort of are hidden gems and tourist destinations that people need to see? So we actually just had a very busy tourist season here in our town because we had this anniversary of the arrival of the ship Hector, which was the 250th anniversary. And we had the uh, 150th birthday of the incorporation of the town back in April and 50 years of our arena. So like we're a very historic town. We have a lot of heritage properties here. We're still learning how to preserve those and like really promote those, I think. And that's another committee I'm on, the Heritage Advisory Committee. So. We do have a lot of heritage homes and uh, I feel like there's lots of information available for them around town. And we have little QR codes you can scan to learn about our rich heritage building. So hopefully there'll be more of a permanent uh, staple in our town when we update our little plaques with historical information. Uh, with the celebration of the arrival of the ship Hector, I'm really proud of my town for stepping up to the plate and following through with uh, the calls uh, to action from the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, because I'm also really big on like, we need to be incorporating uh, the First Nations community across the harbor with more of our planning of events and things, and especially the arrival of the ship Hector, which is basically celebrating colonization, the beginning of colonization in our area. So they have done so much work to engage that community and for our September 30th, which would be a great time to visit our town. Uh, we had the students from the school come over and share about different aspects of indigenous culture while we unveiled a legacy art piece, which was done to show the relationship between the arrival of the ship Hector and the Mi'kmaq set, the Mi'kmaq like in people that were here because ultimately, if they weren't here and if they didn't offer their friendship and knowledge of the land, then the settlers wouldn't have survived their first winter here. So we're taking a good stance on celebrating the friendship and from there celebrating Indigenous culture. So I hope that in the future, Picto can be known as an ambassador for this and celebrating the Mi'kmaq culture from across the harbor, because I think that's super important. That's the original culture and language of the land. 
And I have a weird question and I, I, yeah. I, I apologize if I ask it inappropriately for anyone who's listening or watching this. You, you've mentioned relationships with the uh, Mi'kmaq First Nations uh, and the town, the corporation of the town. Why? And I, I, I kind of I'm asking this in a weird way, so I apologize if it comes out that way. Why do you believe that it's important to to have that strong relationship between the two or uh, entities? I just think that as humanity as a whole, we need to work together to advance humanity. And if we can't do that with our neighbors, and if we like, I feel I don't know. I think that's probably more guilt learning about the way that we treated the people because I didn't learn about that when we were in school. Like I didn't I didn't learn about the atrocities that people faced at residential schools. And yeah, it was really shocking to me. So after learning these things and feeling pretty guilty, I'm thinking, wow, we really need to do better to empower these people and the culture. And 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 I just think that's really important. And I think that's another piece that I play as a counselor. And, and, I, and I appreciate that I can play that role as well because building relationships <laughs> And communicating is so important. <laughs> Have you learned more about yourself in the last three years with trying to build that relationship than you probably wouldn't have if you weren't elected? Yeah. Yeah. And I think I was empowered to make these connections at a at the municipal level, whereas before it would just be me, you know, yeah. like just me doing this. Yeah. So and and if that's what I leave as a counselor then that's great. I'm sure there's other things that I'd like to be credited for, but if it's like establishing this relationship, like our November or September 30th thing was just really, really special. And it just like gave everybody a good vibe. There was this art piece that I was talking about wasn't done by an indigenous artist. It was, but um, he collaborated with the indigenous community. Like it was like, there was a big call, open call for art and whatnot. And anyone could have applied and this guy applied and he did an amazing job. So you need to come and see that monument. That's was my whole part about this, <laughs> but yeah, no. And they were, he got slack for it obviously, cause it gets posted. And then there's people from not around our community that see this and like, what, how can you have a white artist making a, making a piece to commemorate indigenous people and fair point if you don't know the background of it. But I think that we just, it was it was just an eye opener for our town that you just have to be more representative of people and I just I don't know it's I just, want to go back to tourism for a second here because I yeah. am conscious of time. Um, you, you talked about uh, places that where we should visit. Where do you go? Where do you go after a long day of work, after a long day of council meetings to decompress, to just let it all go, to recenter yourself, to refocus and know that tomorrow it's another day and I'm going to have to be at it as deputy mayor, as counselor, as teacher, and as just community member? I'm going to go for a hike. So we have a lot of hiking trails. They look different after Fiona, but they we've got incredible trail volunteers that clear out our trails. And we've also got some pretty awesome beaches. Uh, Caribou Monroe Island Provincial Park is, it's awesome. And you can go for a swim and a hike there and it's beautiful. Uh, is that along have, the Northumberland Strait? Sure is. So it's warm Look as Look at water. that, I know my geography. <laughs> yeah, no, it's right on the Northumberland Strait. Actually, if you came, then it'd be really cool if you could get yourself. So we have, uh, two boat tour companies, as far as I know, uh, that do tours of the strait, like it's seal tours and whatnot, but you need to get to Pictou Island. So Pictou Island's a island between here and Prince Edward Island, and it's not very big. There's no electricity there. Uh, it doesn't have very many full-time residents. Maybe it's less than 10. And it's got quite a history because I used to have a school house there back in the day, not anymore. And yeah, it's it's a it's a beautiful spot to visit for sure, especially if you're around in the summertime. So yeah. I just have to do that. So I'm going to leave on the million dollar question. And this is the most important question I've asked every single person who's ever come on this show with a little caveat of depending on where you live. But in your opinion, what makes the town such a unique place to live, to work and to raise a family? 
Well, it's just a small community. We are by the water. Uh, it's it's gorgeous. We've got beautiful sunrises, beautiful sunsets, and you can watch both of them happen on the waterfront. Um, I, yeah, I've literally lived so many other places and there's something calling me back here and I'm still here right now. It's, we've, we've got people coming from other parts of Canada, like to, they're coming here and they're visiting and they're like, oh my goodness, I've never been here and they're falling in love with it. It's, I think that all of Nova Scotia really is a hidden gem. You could travel from one end to the other and see like the Bay Fundy in itself is incredible. And that's like 45 minute trip from here. We're, we're up Cape Breton Island. You have the Cabot trail there, which is amazing. It's just, it's great. And Picto is just, you know, centrally located. And if you love Anna Green Gables, you just jump on the ferry and you're, you're in PEI. So, and cow's ice cream too, which is pretty great. <laughs> um, Melinda, thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor to sit down and talk to you about your community, about yourself, and just about municipal government with uh, another great municipal leader. So thank you. But thank you for serving your community as well. I don't think municipal leaders get that enough. So thank you so much for serving your community and stepping up and for being part of the democratic process. So thank you so much. Yeah. And thank again, thank you for just you know, providing this perspective for people and giving them some food for thought. And I, I think this is so great. And if anyone I know is looking to run for politics, that you are now the best resource that I have for, for that. Like, so thanks. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. And Thank you for joining us today for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential. Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics from our guest today. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button today. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date on the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support either. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes or by visiting crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering you the kind of content you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of this community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues what truly matter to you and to our communities. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.